25 summers. Explain to us what prisoner classifications are. Yeah, in the prison system, whether you go into Rikers Island or wherever you headed up north, it's a minimum. Minimum is a person that might get busted for three, four times of possession of marijuana, some crack paraphernalia, some pipes, something like that, where it's not a real major threat to society or anything, but they're repetitive in catching these. these it's, they'll become a felony. They're misdemeanors. Misdemeanors turn into small, small lower-level felonies. These people come in upstate. They become minimum classification. Those minimum with the very minimum crime that was committed in society, they allow you to become a ward of the state. Then you have medium. Medium is in between. It can range from robbery to an armed robbery, to a robbery with a knife, to a robbery where you just beat the dudes up and everything. And a lot of people just got broken bones and potty parts and everything was all messed up. And that's a robbery in the first degree. Or it could be chain snatching, whatever. Or it could be shooting somebody lower the waist because shooting somebody lower the waist is an assault charge. An assault charge can land you in the medium status. And then it's the, the dreadful, the last, the maximum, which would be the A1, A2 felonies, which would be the highest felonies you can get in, in the three system. And that's that, that's murder, a homicide, tent murder, you know, cases like that. Bank robberies and stuff like that fall on the heavenly violent crimes because there's things that occur in the crime in the bank robbery. There's the driver, there's the gunmen, there's the ones that are robber in the place, there's ones that assault people in there. So you might just be a driver, like I was explaining to my editor, I was explaining to him that I met a driver, the driver of the Brinks robbery in 1981 named Dave Gilbert. That was a good friend of mine. Instrumentally, he tutored me into getting my GED. And from there, I went on to get college courses because of Dave Gilbert. He was the driver of the Brinks robbery in 1981. He had an 83 number. He just was released from prison last year. Look him up, Dave Gilbert. You'll see what I'm talking about. That's a beautiful dude, man. And all he was was a driver. So you, you explain to me how it is that he did like four decades in prison, but uh, he didn't commit a violent crime. He was just a driver. That's how the system works. Um, do you ever feel like you're still incarcerated at times? Do you have you ever had dreams like you really wasn't out because you did do so much time? Twenty five summers is a long time. Yeah, I still frequently not a lot. They far in between now. Still have dreams waking up in a cell, and it's an eerie feeling. And it's actually weird to me now because some way in your subconscious while I'm sleeping, I actually know that I'm free. I'm in society, but then you. You drift back into a dream and the dream takes control of itself. But then I wake up, I'm inside of a prison cell again and going through the same thing. It's not like, a, oh, my God, here we go again. It's like you're still there and never left. So it's one of the strangest things that you could be deal with, you could face with and everything. But they slowly dissipate as time go on. They far in between now, more so than when I first came home back in 2011. I was having those dreams frequently. Okay, so do you still have any habits from jail because you spent 25 summers there and, you know, you get into certain mm -hmm. routines, so. Yeah, I spoke I spoke on in one of my other pieces in the documentary in 25 summers where I still get in the shower with shower slippers on and I still in the shower with boxer shorts on, my boxer underwear on. And that was just a form of institutionalized in the penitentiary where it was forbidden for you to strip free ball, butt naked in the shower. That was a no can do. And, and definitely no can do to walk around barefooted taking a shower, you know, for fear of fungus or whatever you catch in there because it's hundreds and hundreds of different types of dudes and nationalities with different type of hygienic backgrounds and everything. So you kept your slippers on and you kept your underwear on, man, you know, so... Those phobia, those things I still have and to this day, so I still do them times getting the shower with my boxers on and with my slippers on. You know, I still lining up things like I got OCD, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, keeping abundance of snacks and keeping things in, in order like it was when you was in the cell. Yeah, it's hard to grow out of things like that when you do them repetitively for so many years. But yeah, I do know I'm in free society, man. But yeah, a lot of things I do, still a constant reminder of the time I spent in prison. Do you find yourself looking over your back and analyzing people a lot when you're in crowded settings, like subways and stores? Yeah. And mm -hmm. I do I do often now. I do more so often 
because a lot of freak crazy things are going on in society out here. You know, with people walking around unmedicated from their medications and just tee off and still, you have to be a poor, you have to be aware of your surroundings. So I am conscious of where I'm at and I'm going at all times. I try not to be into the headphone mode where you're blinded to what's going on around you. The only thing is your peripheral and sometimes just your peripheral may be too late for you. So I do stay abreast of what I'm going on because things are happening every day around us in the five boroughs. And I spoke in one of my pieces in the documentary, 25 Summers, about the idiot that jumped on the train and threw the smoke bomb and started shooting people like he was playing a video game or something, which was a very serious event. So to this day still, the answer is no. The officers, I do not feel safe around them. So I'm protecting myself as I go daily to back and forth to and from my travels and everything. Okay, besides yourself. Name some of the most feared prisoners and why they were feared in prison. You know, like here come knockout yeah. Ned or such and such is on the compound, mm. you know. Yeah, K.O. Smitty is a big name. Everyone knows him, who he was. He's actually had to fight, had the chance to fight with Muhammad Ali, but he caught a manslaughter charge and he was put in prison, so he never got a chance to fight with him. He was a dude that was definitely feared because of his ability to knock you out, his ability that he was a professional boxer. The officers were scared of him. They respected him. They called him Mr. Smith. So, yeah, throughout the whole penitentiary of the state of New York, that one name, K.O. Smitty, it really was a legend, really lived up to his name, still knocking out the police all the way to his last days, man. He had cancer in his legs, man, and he had to get him amputated, man. And from there, man, that's when the police said he lost the battle, man, and then they got, they got their revenge back. But for years, for decades, after that, he ranked supreme, man. He knocked the police out in a heartbeat, man. I actually witnessed him knock the police out in Comstock with me in 1990. So he was that dude that was feared. The few other dudes, you know, with, with, with lavish names and all of that, man, never come across, man. But that name happened to stick out the most, K.O. Smitty. Okay, let's talk about taking knives out of people's hands and disarming people of weapons in prison. Yeah, uh, that's a that's a that's an art. That's a that's a that's a vice. That's a, something that you can use to help. We learned a lot of us learned. Uh, Brooklyn actually was the authors of what they call a fighting style, like Mike Tyson spoke about frequently to people that y'all know y'all heard. It was called a fifty-two block. Well, Mike Tyson from Brownsville, fifty-two block originated in Brooklyn. This was a fighting style that showed a complete defense mechanism against your onslaught. That means if someone was coming at you crazy, throwing haymakers and blows, there was moves and ways you could protect yourself where you wouldn't get phased at all. In the process of that, man, it was a heaven defense mechanism. So you was also learn at the snatch of an eye like a cobra, man, how to just, just take the knife out of someone's hand, man, when they least suspect it, or take the razor out of their hand when they least suspect it, and it was called disarming them. This jewel came if you was very, very skilled with your hands. This hand started out in the form of slap boxing. Brooklyn was the originator of what they call the 52 blocks. 52 blocks was a defense mechanism to keep you from getting beat all, punched all in your face and knocked all out, your teeth knocked out, nose broken, all of that. This was an art that was perfected by Brooklyn dudes. Mike Tyson was another one of the authors with that, was very good with that. But yeah, and uh, then it spills over until you get into a penitentiary situation, man, where someone comes at you with a, res a razor or a knife. Nine times out of 10, they don't know what they're doing. Only thing they know is they got a razor. They know if they cut you, you're going to start bleeding, man, and they're going to feel they got the victory, they got the, they got the W. Not necessarily that usually goes down that way. With a lot of guys that, like I said again, they were skilled in that 52 block thing, which was a defense mechanism, would let a dude come up on them and wouldn't run. Might me and myself, I'm not running. They pull out a, a weapon, a razor, or a knife. I'm not running. Because if you run, you're going to get gunned down, just like in the street. So you stand there and you fight. But you use your skills. You use the skills that you acquired, the skills you learned. If you was knew how to lower your pride and ask for help, you could learn how to fight. You could learn how to get nice with your hands and all that. You didn't have to resort to having a weapon. It's like the Puerto Ricans should have did, but they didn't do it. So now 
you know, these guys, black brothers, they learned the 52 block mechanism. And in the process of that, man, you can get this on for your weapon real quick and get it used on you, man. And that might be the most embarrassing moment of your life. There's no recovering from that once you pull a razor out on me and I take it from you. So the Puerto Ricans had weapons first. Yeah, they started the weapon thing, yeah. They started the weapon thing, like I said in my other segment, or previous segment in 25 Summers, is because, like I said... The Black Brothers was the originators of the hand game, the fighting game, the 52 block game, the five minutes in the day room corner game. It was about blacks fighting, knuckling up to see who was the better man. The Puerto Rican brothers didn't feel that they can, they can hang with a situation like that. They didn't feel that they can uh, cope with fighting somebody straight up like that. So what they did is they took their toothbrushes, man, and they melted them down. They used to give us straight A's ridges to strafe once or twice a week to shave, pull out the razor out of it, and melt it into... Melted inside of the plastic of the toothbrush, sharpen it down now, and now you got like a one blade knife. And instead of them fighting a fist fight with someone, they will cut you. And if they cut you, you will be bleeding. And then with your adrenaline flowing, you will bleed a lot. And then once you bleed a lot, man, then the usually person that sees their blood spilling out like that gets hysterical or whatever the case is. And, you know, they retreat. They get into the flight mode or they get into the flee mode. But as you know, once you spilling out and you're linking with, as they say, bleeding profusely, yeah, you retreat, you know. And the Puerto Ricans started that. Okay, speaking of Puerto Ricans, we're going to stay along those lines. You spoke about a beef with the Cubans in Shawanga, and nobody will help you. Explain yeah, more of that. You were saying crazy, something man. to me about that. Explain yeah, these things was crazy. See, what, what I understand all sectors, man. I dealt with a lot of Puerto Ricans. I dealt with rat hunters. I dealt with Latin kings and all that. But these Cubans was a different breed of dudes. These were these jungle dudes. Like I said, you could look it up and Google it. In 1981, Fidel Castro exiled over 350 prisoners from Cuba. And these dudes made it their way to Miami. And from Miami, they made it their way over to New York. And from New York time, 90 days later, like three, two thirds of these people were all locked up on Rikers Island. They all was native Cubans. These Cuban dudes are used to living a jungle life in the jungle over there. So they know how to use their knife. They know how to make weapons. They know how to do all this stuff. In the penitentiary that I was in, they stick together. They are a small knitted group, but they stick together. You might got one, two in every jail, but they really do stick together and they cause a real serious problem. Now, and I had a problem with one of them, right? As I said in one of my last segments in Shawanga, I happen to give one of them something, man, by way, you know, a couple of bags of smoke, a couple of bags of sneeze, you know what I'm saying? And then they took it upon themselves that they wasn't going to pay me. I guess they did try to do their homework on me, realize I wasn't down with no gang, so he don't have a thousand dudes behind him or whatever. So they actually deaded me for the money, you know? So when they deaded me for the money, you know, like I said, I'm going to take exception to that, man. I didn't buy out to nobody, man. I gave this dude the business. I tore him up. But little did I know, tearing them up wasn't the end of that. Because like I said in just the previous, they're a close-netted group. As I get sent to another prison, boom, word get to the next word, to the prison. And the Cuban dude over there, man, hit me and tore me up. You know what I'm saying? And this was because one of his countrymen, I did this to one of his countrymen. So they they very, very thorough about their people, man. And about getting them. And like I said, these dudes are from the jungle, man. They're not to fight to the death with knives, you know. The average black brother that's in the penitentiary in the state, man, he see a knife and another dude pull out a knife. He's thinking of two things, either run or how I'm going to get away with this one, get over with this one without getting hurt or anything like that. The wrong way to think when you're going up against them Cubans. The way to think is when they pull a knife, you pull yours, man, you tear his ass out the frame. Because if you don't, best for sure, he's going to do you. And that's what happened with us.